Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business today is portfolio questions. I'd invite uh, short questions and answers, please, to allow as many questions as possible. Question one, Liz Smith. To ask the government what it and its agencies are doing to promote Perth as one of Scotland's cities. Cabinet Secretary Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, Perth is a modern, dynamic international city able to contribute nationally and locally to driving Scotland's economy. Uh, as members are aware, Perth regained city status in 2012, and as a result of that, it now plays a very full part in the Scottish Cities Alliance. Uh, could I thank the Smith. Cabinet Secretary uh, for her answer? Could I ask what assessment uh, the Scottish Government has made of the calls from Transform Scotland to create a new intercity rail hub at Perth Station as a catalyst for transport connectivity, urban regeneration and economic regeneration for Perth. Well, as the member will be aware, we are always happy to engage with uh, proposals of any nature, and I'm sure the Transport uh, Minister, who's sitting next to me here, would always be uh, willing to engage and, and will engage directly with the member on the specific point she raises. Uh, the proposal the member has just outlined, as I'm sure she will, uh, is aware, would cost in the region of £1 billion. Uh, it would require uh, cutting across the existing M9 motorway, so there are significant challenges. Uh, with the proposal that she uh, puts forward, but we are always willing to engage and we'll continue uh, to do that. And uh, I'd be happy, I'm sure the Transport Minister would be happy to discuss those challenges in more detail with her. Thank you. Question two, Mary Scanlon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of CalMAC and what issues were discussed. Minister Keith Brown. The Transport Scotland officials meet regularly with CalMAC representatives to discuss a range of matters relating to ferry services in Scotland, and I last, uh, last met with CalMAC representatives a fortnight ago to discuss a number of uh, matters of mutual interest. Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. Is the government aware of the widespread concerns of the public and business sector in the Western Isles that due to reduced timetable options and the removal of a dedicated freight ferry, the current major public investment in the Stornoway to Ullapool service will actually lead to a reduced service, particularly during peak periods? So given the significant contribution our island communities make to the social cultural and economic well-being of our nation, does the government not recognise and accept the need for this investment to be augmented by the retention of a dedicated freight vessel to provide the much-needed increase in capacity and timetable choices for users of the service? Yeah, I think I would choose to characterise the £43 million investment that we're making in the new vessel in a different way from the way that Mary Scanlon has done. And I should also reassure her that in terms of the freight capacity, there will be more than adequate freight capacity on the new vessel, uh, the MV Loch Seaforth, when it uh, enters service. We have said that we will keep another vessel on standby in the intervening period, but um, both in terms of the £43 million investment for the new vessel, but also in terms of the new contribution to the Stornoway's uh, harbour infrastructure, as well as that at uh, Ullapool, we are confident this will provide an improvement and has been uh, staunchly supported by many people, seeing this huge investment from uh, a new vessel of £43 million worth to the two older vessels which are there. And there have been questions of reliability, for example, in relation to the freight vessel. So we are confident that the capacity will be there. Thanks. Kenny Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. Our islanders are delighted that the Scottish Government is investing £2 million a year to roll out road equivalent tariff to Arran from October and have warmly welcomed the Minister's announcement. Does the Minister therefore share my disappointment that CalMAC is seeking to dilute that commitment by trying to avoid implementing RET on weekend summer sailings? Sir. I think the short answer is no, I, I don't share that disappointment because I'm aware that there's not an attempt here to dilute the commitment to RET, but instead, as has been made clear right the way through this process, that there will be issues of demand management which are necessary. I, I know the member is aware of that. Uh, the operator, again in line with what we said in the ferries plan, is in discussion with the community about the need for some form of demand management to be introduced during the summer 2015 timetable. Part really of the success of introducing RET in the first place. Uh, we're very clear that they will only be introduced, though, where the project the demand on a particular route as a result of the introduction of RET indicates that that is necessary. And crucially, from the member's point of view, uh, demand management techniques will only be introduced if they are agreed uh, by the community. Hey, thanks. Question three, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how its city strategy will support public bodies in the Aberdeen city region that find it hard to recruit staff because of the high cost of living relative to the rest of the country. Secretary Nicholas Sturgeon. 
Uh, the Scottish Cities Alliance brings together all of our seven cities in collaborative partnership with the Scottish Government to focus on creating jobs, developing infrastructure and boosting economic activity across our cities and their regions. Uh, that approach is also supported by other key Scottish Government policies, such as our commitments on affordable housing and housing supply, our social wage commitments and a public sector pay policy which focuses resources on the lower paid. Ms. Macdonald. I welcome uh, those priorities in the Cabinet Secretary's response. She will recognise that the unique needs of the oil producing region around Aberdeen a generation ago attracted unique solutions, particularly in terms of affordable housing for incoming workers. Given the challenge uh, there again today, will she take a lead in government in seeking to join up the initiatives taken by different public sector uh, employers in the city region, whether that be by recruitment and retention pay supplements, by additional support for housing, uh, or by other means? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think Lewis Macdonald uh, makes a, a fair suggestion there, and I'm more than happy, uh, either through the Cities Alliance or in whatever other way might be appropriate, to look at how we can ensure that the work that he acknowledges is being done uh, across the public sector is properly coordinated to ensure that we're providing uh, solutions that are fit for purpose, given the circumstances he outlines in Aberdeen. Um, as the member will be aware, how we allocate uh, resources for affordable housing uh, takes account of need uh, in different areas. He's also uh, referred to the flexibilities within our pay policy and recruitment and retention premium that can be paid by NHS uh, employers where there is a case that can be made. Uh, so he is right to acknowledge the work that has been done, but uh, in the interest of trying to build uh, consensus around this. I'm more than happy to give him an undertaking today that I'll consider uh, what can be done to ensure that there is a fully joined up approach to that and I'm happy to liaise with him further once I've had the opportunity to give it that consideration. Many thanks. Maureen Watt. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. As others have alluded to, the high cost of living is often due to uh, the lack of affordable um, housing. How important does the Cabinet Secretary think it is, um, is for the uh, City Council public bodies um, and the private sector to release land and work together to increase the amount of affordable housing in the North East? Well, Maureen Watt is absolutely correct uh, to raise this as an important issue. I should also record that Maureen Watt has previously raised the issue of the cost of living in Aberdeen uh, with ministers and has uh, had discussions with John Swinney on this particular issue. Land availability is obviously an important element of strategic local programme deliverability and we would expect to see an adequate supply of this. In Aberdeen that combines land owned by registered social landlords and significant other sites zoned for housing in the current development plan which have a planning obligation for affordable uh, housing. So the point uh, Maureen Watt raises is an important one uh, and I'm happy to factor that into the consideration that I've just undertaken to Lewis Macdonald to uh, undertake. Many thanks. Uh, question four, Nigel Don. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities has had with the Minister for Environment and Climate Change regarding the long-term impact of flooding on infrastructure. Cabinet Secretary Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, I'm in regular dialogue with ministerial colleagues on a wide range of issues of mutual interest. Nigel Don. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response to a convoluted question, which rather makes the point that flooding uh, is no respecter of persons or portfolios. Uh, and my very rural constituents, of course, see flooding as affecting both their homes, the farmland, the roads that run the drains. Uh, and I'm wondering whether the Cabinet Secretary can assure me that the Scottish Government has a good look at how these things are funded across the country, in particular, of course, in my constituency, to make sure that the funds are available to deal with all these problems. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as uh, Nigel Dawn will appreciate, these issues are matters of enormous priority to the Government generally and obviously to Paul Wheelhouse uh, in particular. The National Flood Risk Assessment takes into account the impact of flooding on property, infrastructure, agricultural land. It forms the basis of our current work to produce uh, our first ever flood risk strategies, which are intended to help inform decisions around the prioritisation of flood risk actions, as well as supporting decisions that are made by local authorities and community groups. Uh, this work has also fed into the cross-government work to deliver our first statutory climate change adaptation programme which responds to a wide range of potential climate change impacts including of course flooding and through this work individual parts of the Scottish Government are working to ensure that they 
their own policy areas are recognising and adapting to these pressures. So I hope that gives Nigel Dawn uh, assurance that this is something that very much feeds into every part of the work of the Scottish Government. Thank you. Davish Scott. Can I agree, uh, uh, Presiding Officer, with the sentiment of Nigel Dawn's question and ask the Cabinet Secretary whether, the, whether she'd be able to clarify for Parliament the balance of uh, funding that would be available between large-scale uh, investments and the kind that Nigel Dawn has just illustrated and smaller-scale uh, needs that exist in his and my constituency in relation to both flooding and coastal protection? I'm very happy to, uh, if, if it's uh, acceptable to Tavish Scott, to write to him with more detail on that because obviously there is a general question there that will be impacted in terms of the specific uh, demands for funding that he has in mind. So um, I'll uh, consult with colleagues, Paul Wheelhouse in particular, and come back to him uh, with the detail he's looking on as quickly as possible. Thank you. Jamie McGregor. Uh, to, uh, um, what discussions has the Cabinet Secretary had with colleagues to ensure that the appropriate cleaning of gullies burns and culverts is taking place to prevent the flooding on roads, such as the A85 near to Lockall village, which constantly floods in heavy rains. Um, I can assure uh, the member that these discussions take place uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, the Transport Minister has had some specific discussions uh, around the issues uh, to do with roads that uh, the member uh, has raised. All of these issues that are uh, particular risk factors uh, of flooding are uh, absolutely central to the work we do overall in flooding, and I'm more than happy uh, either personally or uh, through the appropriate uh, minister uh, to provide further detail to any ministers with particular local issues on these points. Many thanks. Question five, Annabel Goldie. To ask the Scottish Government what its plans are for Presswick Airport. Secretary. Uh, our overall aim, as I've uh, advised Parliament previously, is to return the airport to profitability as soon as is possible. We will shortly receive a report from our senior adviser, uh, who, members will recall, was appointed for a period of three months to inform us on the longer-term options for future business development and the management of Presswick Airport. And once that report has been uh, received, I hope to be in a position to provide a full update to the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee next month. Honourable Goldie. Uh, I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary. The, the three-month period technically expired yesterday, so what is the new timescale for monitoring progress and reporting to Parliament? And particularly, the Deputy First Minister in her evidence to the Parliament Committee on 19th March mentioned a potential for increasing passenger and freight usage at Presswick. So what steps has the Scottish Government been taking to investigate if that is a realisable objective? Well, I'm sure Annabel Goldie will appreciate that, well, firstly, I, I believe that there is a consensus in this Parliament that the Government is right to be taking the action it has taken uh, to secure the future of Presswick Airport. Uh, the current management team at Presswick Airport has continued to engage as is appropriate uh, with any interested party to seek to uh, bring new business to Presswick and to explore opportunities for new business. Uh, however, we specifically uh, asked the consultant to prepare an in-depth report for us. As I've said, uh, he had three months uh, in which to prepare that report. Annabel Goldie is right to say that that period has now expired, so I expect to take delivery of that uh, and to have the appropriate time to properly consider that report very, very soon. Uh, and I will give the Infrastructure and Investment Committee and, as appropriate, the whole Parliament uh, a full update on where we intend to go and where the... Uh, the plans for press we contend to go both around the governance and the management of the airport and the plans for expanding its business opportunities as, is, as quickly as reasonably practicable. But I know all members will appreciate that it is vitally important that we take the time to consider what the best short, medium and long term options are for the airport in order that we can be in the best possible position to deliver on our objective of returning the airport to profitability as soon as possible. And I will share uh, those plans as fully as possible with Parliament as soon as I'm in a position to do so. Thank you. Chick Brody. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government to confirm that Presswick Airport will, in its initial recovery phase, the short term, focus firstly on its capabilities as an MRO airport supported by the great engineering skills based on the airport perimeter and in the aero engineering training at Ayrshire Colleges, and secondly, on its abilities to handle and promote wide-bodied freight air transport for cargo exports. Uh, Chick Brody is right to point to uh, the strengths that Presswick Airport has, and he's 
uh, mentioned a number of them. The MRO uh, facility at the airport is one of those particular assets and strengths uh, that is available to the airport. But to follow on the answer I gave to Annabelle Goldie, uh, returning the airport to profitability is going to require improvements right across uh, the whole business of the airport. And that will include Yes, developing new passenger and freight services, uh, but it will also include things like increasing the revenue from retail outlets and seeking to maximise the property portfolio of the airport. Where we seek to strike the balance between these different objectives will depend very much on the uh, views and the recommendations that are made to us in the consultant's report. And once I have that, once I've had the opportunity to consider that properly, uh, I'll be in a position uh, to share more fully with Parliament what we see the particular interventions uh, that we need to make in the, medium, uh, the short, medium and long term to Presswick to get it back to profitability as quickly as is possible. James Kelly. Uh, thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary state if the monthly level of losses at Presswick Airport uh, is increasing and also state how the government intends to recover these losses and previous investment to the public purse. I, I will provide um, on a regular basis. I last did this, of course, when I appeared before the Infrastructure Committee. Um, the financial position uh, around the airport and in particular the investment uh, that the government uh, is making. But James Kelly will recall that the principle upon which we have acquired the airport is the principle of ensuring a return on taxpayer investment. That is required in order to make uh, our uh, acquisition and intervention in the airport compliant with EU state aid regulations. So that is the overriding objective. Whatever we invest in the airport, and I've been upfront and continue to be upfront, that it will require investment in order to achieve our longer term objective. But that investment is designed uh, to ensure that long term return on taxpayer investment. And uh, uh, we'll continue to report to Parliament as appropriate on the progress that we're making. Thank you. Question six, Alison Johnson. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what plans Scottish Water has to promote the use of its assets for the generation of renewable energy. Okay. Uh, Scottish Water already produces around 7% of the energy it consumes through hydro, wind and solar generation schemes on its assets. Uh, Scottish Water will continue to seek opportunities to invest directly or to work in partnership with others to increase renewable energy generation where it is cost effective to do so. Alison Johnson. Um, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that information. Scottish Water is a successful publicly owned business with huge potential for renewable energy generation. And under the new 2015 to 21 business plan just published, they will invest 11.2 million in hydro, wind and solar schemes to increase the renewable output to 75 gigawatt hours a year. The Scottish Government consultation on a hydro nation stated that Scottish Water had the potential to generate in excess of 1,000 gigawatt hours a year. So is this a lack of ambition? What more could Scottish Water do with its new powers under the Water Resources Act and what is holding them back? I don't think it is a lack of ambition because I think uh, what uh, the member has just outlined there has to be seen in context of what Scottish Water exists to do and what its investment priorities will be over the next uh, six year period. Over that period, Scottish Water will be required to invest some £3.6 billion pounds in our water and sewerage assets to deliver improved services. That investment implies a growth in its need for energy because energy is needed to operate the installations that it will build. Within its wholesale business, so Scottish Water is proposing to offset that higher energy demand with energy efficiency measures and renewable energy that it generates from its assets, for example, as the member has indicated through uh, hydro power. Um, as I said in my original answer, Scottish Water has uh, got an annual energy requirement of 450 gigawatts, presently generates around 7% of the energy it consumes, but through innovative use of its assets, such as treatment works, pipes, catchments and pipelines, it's capable of significantly increasing this proportion and is working to do so. A further 350 gigawatts is generated at Whiteley through landlord arrangements, and by 2018, Scottish Water does expect to generate over 1,000 gigawatts through its own investments in renewable energy and through landlord arrangements. So I think that is significant ambition and recognises the obligations uh, on Scottish Water to be energy efficient and to reduce its carbon footprint as much as possible. Thank you. Question seven, Kenny Gibson. 
To ask the Scottish Government what estimate it has made of how much would have been saved if the PPP PFI projects carried out during the previous administration had been funded through the non-profit distribution model. Cabinet Secretary Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, the rates applicable to any project reflect the market conditions when the actual contract is signed, so it's not possible to assess exactly what savings might have been made. But the NPD model ensures that private sector returns are capped and that there's no dividend-bearing equity which avoids the excessive returns and the poor taxpayer value for money associated with past PFI projects. NPD also enhances stakeholder involvement and ensures any surpluses can be directed in favour of the public sector. Gibbs. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. In North Ayrshire, annual PFI payments uh, will increase from 11.1 million in 2007 to 16.1 million in 2037, meaning £400 million will ultimately be paid over 30 years for schools with a capital cost of only £81 million. Does she agree that the profligacy of Labour and the Lib Dems means that local authorities are stuck paying increased PFI charges year on year and that rising payments are limiting North Ayrshire's ability to invest in jobs and services? Briefly, please. Uh, yes, I do agree with Kenny Gibson. The fact of the matter is the PFI approach that was used in the past hasn't delivered best value for the taxpayer. And I can assure Kenny Gibson that the mistakes made with earlier PFI contracts will not be repeated. It is absolutely vital that the NPD programme delivers that value for taxpayers' money, and this government intends to ensure that it does. Many thanks. And we now move to culture and external affairs questions. Question one, Gil Patterson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assistance it receives from British embassies to help promote major events such as Homecoming Scotland 2014. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop to answer that question when she's ready, please. The Scottish Government is aware that embassies and consulates have been provided assistance by promoting information about homecoming Scotland 2014 through their network of media and promotional contacts, uh, more specifically with the assistance of the consulates in Milan and Hamburg, Visit Scotland organised and delivered media and trade events in these key cities to launch Homecoming Scotland. The Foreign uh, Commonwealth Office Network also announced the launch of Scotland's 2013-14 Winter Festival campaign and St Andrew's Day toolkits were sent to Toronto Chicago, Boston, Virginia, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York City, Washington, New York, uh, Brussels and Queensland, 11 uh, of their 270 offices in order to support the celebrations. Thank you very much. Gil Patterson. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that having Scottish embassies around the world will allow Scotland to be promoted 365 days a year, which will result in a far greater awareness of what our country has to offer, and uh, which in turn will lead to greater opportunities for Scottish businesses throughout the world. Uh, yes, I do. I, I have put on record and appreciate the support um, the embassies provide under their current responsibilities. However, a Scottish embassy will have five core functions. Uh, commercial, to maximise commercial benefits for Scottish businesses. Governmental, to ensure effective engagement with governments and other public institutions. Cultural, to promote Scottish culture internationally. Um, development, to ensure Scotland's international development priorities and commitments are made. And, of course, consular uh, support. Uh, but as Gil Patterson has, has set out, Scottish embassies will be promoting Scottish interests every day of every year with an independent Scotland. Thank you. Our question two, Richard Simpson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what health-related programmes it is supporting in Malawi. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government's International Development uh, Fund for Malawi supports 16 uh, health-related projects with uh, over a total of five uh, million. That's six health projects in the funding round 2012-2015 uh, and 10 in the funding round 2013-2016. These include projects addressing community needs uh, in maternal health, health awareness, a mobile clinic, medical training, uh, mental health, cancer treatment, meningitis awareness uh, and a whole host of others as well. Further details of all our projects are on the Scottish Government website. <coughs> Richard Simpson. Uh, can I thank the uh, Minister for his response? Uh, I'm particularly interested in, in two aspects. One's midwifery, but I want to ask about the mental health side. And I should declare, Deputy Presiding Officer, my um, uh, fellowship at the Royal College of Psychiatry. The college has a charity supporting training of psychiatrists in, in Malawi, where there is a, 
really very serious and indeed dire shortage. And I wonder if the government has considered the possibility of incentivizing donations from charity, because that leverage system does seem to produce uh, more funding. So I wonder if that's something that has been considered. Minister. I'd like to put on, on, on note and record the, the work that Richard Simpson has done in this. I know uh, midwifery is an issue of his uh, that he's taken in the past and also uh, malaria uh, as well that he's uh, raised uh, awareness of in this particular issue. Uh, yes, we do actually incentivise it through some of our grant funding rounds. Uh, we welcome um, uh, match funding, uh, for example, in the small grant scheme that we launched uh, last uh, October, uh, last September, sorry, and we will continue to do that. But I'm more than happy if there's a specific project uh, that's looking into that to, to, to provide more detail to Richard Simpson. But it is incentivised. Match funding is welcome, and I agree with him entirely. Having done fundraising for NGOs in the past, it's certainly an easier way to, to get money out of donors. <laughs> Question three, Michael McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government how many naval vessel, vessels it considers would be required to enforce a ban on EU fishing fleets in Scottish waters if proposals for an independent Scotland's membership of the EU were not accepted. Secretary Fiona Hislop. An independent Scotland would continue EU membership and as such we would expect mutual access to fishing opportunities to continue. Uh, Michael McMahon. Yeah, I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I don't know what question it was she was answering, but it wasn't the one <laughs> that I asked. If the First Minister is going to go to, Br uh, to Bruges and threaten to use gunboat diplomacy, if his negotiation skills fail, would it not be a good idea to actually know the size of the fleet that you would be required to enforce your ban? And is that really the way that we want to look forward to our discussions with the European Union? If Scotland ever became independent. Minister. No. Cabinet well, Secretary, rather. The First Minister did no such thing, and clearly, uh, by his supplementary question, the member doesn't understand the difference between access to fishing opportunities in waters and access for navigation through waters. And also, it's quite clear that the, the member, just as well he isn't the fisheries spokesperson for his party, doesn't understand the current situation. Maybe I can explain. Marine Scotland, which is under the devolved responsibility of the Scottish Government, is responsible currently for fishery and marine protection in Scottish waters. It routinely monitors the activities of all non-Scottish vessels currently in our waters using three offshore patrol vessels, two long-range aircraft and satellite information which reports the position of vessels every two hours. Of course, what Mr McMahon does identify is to highlight the current conventional capability gaps that have been created as a result of Westminster government cuts. For example, presiding officer, there are no major surface vessels based in Scotland and no maritime patrol aircraft. Uh, that is extraordinary and an unacceptable gap. It has seen the ships dispatched from the south of England to the Moray Firth in response to Russian naval activity. And that current gap also means that the UK is having to rely on NATO allies to help cover routine maritime patrol duties, a responsibility an independent Scotland will take more seriously. Perhaps Mr McMahon might want to do his research before he comes to the Chamber. Thank you. Anna Will Goldie. The reply from the Cabinet Secretary indicates an interesting scenario. Um, in the uh, situation outlined by the question, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm in that scenario, where are these vessels coming from, given there would no longer be a Royal Naval uh, support from the rest of the United Kingdom? Would we rent the vessels? Would we buy the vessels? What plan has she in mind? Secretary. Okay, so, sorry, President Officer, I have to repeat my point. The Royal Navy currently does not provide support in terms of uh, maritime fishery uh, protection currently. However, the main point, the main point here, President Officer, is to, to look at the position that we would find ourselves in, and we agree with Sir David Edward that it would be absolutely absurd to have a situation uh, that uh, Scotland would uh, somehow not be a, a member of the EU in that 18-month period, and we also accept the provisions by the Professor James Crawford, who was paid by the UK Government to provide legal advice, where he stated that the 18-month estimate for negotiating membership is a realistic one. So I think people should be aware of the current maritime uh, fisheries protection that currently takes place as a responsibility of Marine Scotland of this Government currently, but also recognise the common sense position that's been set out consistently by this Government. Question four, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the recent remarks by the Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs regarding an independent Scotland's entry into the UK. 
Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government rejects the position set out by Mr Haig in his letter to the First Minister of 27th of April in its entirety. Uh, the First Minister has responded and made clear in his reply that these comments show a complete lack of engagement by the UK Government on all of the issues. Uh, most specifically, its continued refusal uh, to present the Commission with a precise legal scenario on membership of an independent Scotland. The biggest risk to Scotland's membership of the EU lies not in Scottish independence, but in the possibility of a UK in-out referendum on EU membership. Sure. Colin Beatty. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that despite Mr Haig's claims that the UK has a proven track record in delivering for Scottish interests in the EU, this is at odds with Owen Paterson's recent reported breach on an agreement to make clear to European ministers Scotland's opposition to genetically modified crops? and further agree with me in the recent Electoral Reform Society Close the Gap report that the EU should look to improve the involvement of devolved parliaments and regional representatives, especially when their member state representatives cannot be relied upon to adequately represent our interests. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I understand that the issue recently came to light in a committee appearance by Mr Patterson. Uh, at the March Environment Council, uh, Owen Patterson had agreed to raise the need for any EU agreement, um, allowing member states to make their own decisions about growing GM crops and to permit Scotland to take its own decisions and not be bound by UK government views. However, he failed to do so, I understand. Currently, there is no facility for committees of the Scottish Parliament to hold UK ministers to account for the position the UK adopts at Council. Scottish ministers do not have the right to participate in council meetings to represent the Scottish interests and of course only as an independent member state can Scotland's voice be heard at council. Thank you. Question 5, Siobhan McMahon. I ask the Scottish Government whether in deciding its international development expenditure it takes into account how developing countries balance meeting the needs and interests of business with those of people living in poverty. Minister, I'm saying yourself. Uh, yes, we do. All of our international development expenditure is focused on helping people uh, living in poverty in developing countries uh, in line with the Millennium Development Goals and the development plans of those priority countries. As part of this, uh, we seek to work alongside the private sector and civil society uh, to help foster a global partnership for development, which is uh, MDG 8. Thank you. Siobhan McMahon. Thank the Minister for that answer. A recent SCIAF event which I co-hosted provided an opportunity to meet SCIAF and its partners from Colombia and hear at first hand about the impact of big business on that country's Afro-Colombian and Indigenous communities. We heard that rich landowners, armed groups and multinational companies, including those registered in the UK and Scotland, are now forcing people off their land so it can be used for mining, banana plantations, cattle ranching and drug trafficking. Does the Minister agree with SCIAF, who believe that Scotland can and should play its part in promoting ethical and responsible business practices, and how will the Scottish Government take a proactive role in promoting human rights and responsible behaviour from Scottish businesses? Minister. Yes, I do agree with Skiaf and I agree with what the member uh, said. I didn't get to meet the Colombian delegation this time, but I met them last year uh, when they came round. There's two, two ways uh, we can really do this. Uh, one is domestically, of course, uh, through uh, promoting through the procurement bill, as, 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 uh, as the member knows. We included in uh, a clause about uh, ethical and fairly traded goods, so that's showing in domestic legislation uh, what we can do. We're also working uh, alongside the Scottish Human Rights Commission, who have developed their action plan on human rights. A uh, part of that is to see how we can incorporate what are known as the Ruggie Principles, which are the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So we can do that domestically. We can also do it in legislation, but we can also do it through the National uh, Action Plan. I'm happy to provide the, the member uh, with more details if she requires or needs. Thanks. Question six, Hugh Henry. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has received advice from the European Commission that if Scotland separates from the UK, it would need to apply to the EU as a new member state rather than assuming continuing membership. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, we have received no advice from the Commission to this effect. Indeed, the Commission has made clear that it will not issue an opinion until it is presented with a precise scenario from the UK Government. I would welcome this. However, the UK Government has repeatedly refused to jointly approach the Commission with the precise legal scenario on Scottish independence. The Scottish Government proposes that an independent Scotland negotiates from within the EU via an amendment under Article 48 of the Treaty of the European Union on the terms to be agreed with other member states 
as outlined on page 221 of Scotland's Future. The Scottish Government recognises it will be for the EU Member States, meeting under the auspices of the Council, to take forward the most appropriate procedure under which an independent Scotland will become a signatory to the EU treaties at the point at which it becomes independent, taking into account Scotland's status as an EU jurisdiction of 40 years standing. Thank you. Hugh Henry. Uh, President Officer, the Cabinet Secretary may wish to read the letter uh, written by Vivian Redding, uh, the Vice President of the Commission, to the European Committee. That letter states that under Article 49 of the Treaty, any European state which respects the principles of the European Union may apply to become a member of the EU, but then but also says that a new independent region would, by fact, the fact of its independence, become a third country with respect to the Union and the treaties would, from the day of its independence, not apply any more uh, on its territory. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with Vivian Redding? Secretary. I, I discussed uh, Vivian Redding's letter indeed with the European Committee. Uh, her opinion uh, does not concern the particular circumstances of Scotland, as Ms Redding is talking about the conventional route for enlargement under Article 49. Uh, the Scottish Government's proposal, as I have just set out, is uh, via Article 48. Moreover, uh, Mr Henry might uh, be interested to be aware of correspondence that I placed in SPICE um, earlier in April. Uh, we know that from our recent request for information to the European European Council and European Commission uh, received on the 1st of April 2014 from Dr Marianne Klingbeil, uh, Deputy Secretary General to the Secretary uh, General of the European Commission and Jacob Thompson from the General Secretary of the Council of the European Union, both stating that neither institution holds an analysis on Scotland's membership of the EU under 40, Article 48 or 49 uh, and that was published in SPICE on 22nd of April and I refer the member to look at those letters. Thank you. Question seven, Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its international development programme supports young people wanting to carry out voluntary work overseas. Minister Humza Yusuf. Uh, the Scottish Government has committed uh, £9 million uh, per year to its International Development Fund. Although the fund does not uh, offer direct financial support to young people uh, wanting to carry out voluntary work uh, in overseas, uh, overseas, we do provide funding to NIDOS uh, and to the Scottish Malawi Partnership, both organisations the member will be aware of. Uh, they provide information to young people about volunteering opportunities. And recently, uh, the Scottish Malawi Partnership hosted the Youth Congress on the 31st of March 2014, which I attended. Uh, 200 young people from across Scotland uh, also attended uh, the event, which included information stalls and exhibitions on volunteering uh, in Malawi. Many thanks. Margaret Mitchell. <laughs> For that answer, the Minister will be aware that the Department of International Development ESCO Bride funds a very successful programme for young people to volunteer abroad, the International Citizen Service, and that approximately 600 people work in the ESCO Bride um, DFID office. Can the Minister confirm that the programme, that programmes such as this one, will remain open to Scottish young people if Scotland separates from the rest of the UK, and that the 600 people employed in administration of schemes to improve some of the, the world's most deprived areas can be assured that their jobs will be safe in an independent Scotland. Minister, briefly, if you could. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, I made this point at the committee. I've made it uh, various times afterwards that this government has uh, promised continuity of employment for those who are employed in different and other reserved functions uh, here in Scotland. I find it quite poor, actually, that uh, when UK government ministers come up to lecture Scotland about uh, not going independent, that they use this issue in particular. I know Margaret Mitchell wasn't doing this, but I was quite upset actually at some of the comments by her colleague Alan Duncan and previously by Justine Greening about using the poorest people in the world as a political football in regards to this debate. I think we should be very much above that. Scotland will have a great contribution to make. We have historically made a great contribution to tackling global poverty. Let's continue to do that. And we'll work, of course, as, as an independent country, we'll work with DFID, we'll work with USAID, and we'll work with uh, anybody who wants to fight global poverty from across the world. Thanks. <laughs> Question eight, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what it next plans to visit Poland. Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, I have no immediate plans to visit Poland again. I have just returned yesterday from a two-day two -day visit to Krakow and Warsaw. Uh, there were great opportunities to deepen diplomatic relations, promote cultural cooperation and to develop business links. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Will she agree that the 160,000 people from other EU states, including myself, 
and those from Poland who have chosen to live and work in Scotland are making a massive contribution to Scotland's economy and culture, and that only a yes vote in September will ensure that they keep their status as EU resident with the extra democratic benefit to have the right to vote in every election in an independent Scotland. Um, I visited the Polish club last week. I recognise the contribution that over 60,000 Poles living in Scotland make as a critical contribution to our economy. And indeed, he references the 160,000 other people from other EU states. I think it is important that we make a statement that these workers who work very hard and contribute to our society are most welcome here and that we expect that welcome to continue as Scotland remains in the EU. Thank you. We now move to the next item of business, which is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on the bedroom tax discretion.